what's up everybody and welcome to What's Up with Dr. A. Nathan Young. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm so glad that all over the place you're telling me how this ministry is blessing you and how you're tuning in and how you can't wait to see it on Sunday mornings. We thank God that this ministry is blessing so many people all over this region and we thank God for the fruit that it's going to produce in your life. We're going to go into our 11 a.m. service at our Covington campus right now. Meet us right back here in 26 minutes. I can't wait to see you. I'm super, super excited about this series that we're starting today. The reason why is because it's something that's been on my heart for a while now. Because Faith Bible Church, y'all, we've been around for 30 years, and God's blessed us to do a lot of good work in the community. He's blessed us to win a lot of people to Christ. God has just used Faith Bible Church to just impact the lives of the people who attend here, and I'm so excited about that. And the reason why we're calling this Next Level is because I really, really believe that there's a next level that God has for us to go to, the next level of reaching lost people for him the next level of serving our community, the next level of being involved. Watch this. And then God reminded me there's some things that I want to do, not just in the church, but for the people in the church where I take them to the next level in their marriage, where I take them to the next level in their careers, where I take them to the next level in their personal lives. And just praying about it, thinking about it, God just just show me some stuff that I want to show you that I believe that it takes in order for us as a church, you as a family, you as a student, you as a career person, whatever application you make to it, some principles in order for you to go to the next level. And I'm telling you, if you take these and apply them to your life, If you take them and use them, you'll watch as you begin to achieve things that you've been trying to achieve. So the first thing that we're talking about today in order to get to the next level is commitment. Commitment in a nutshell is refusing to quit. You know why many times people don't achieve what they're supposed to achieve? It's not because they're not smart enough. It's not because they don't have the resources. It's not because of any of the many things that we tend to blame it on. 9.9 times out of 10, the reason why we don't achieve, become the people, become the couple, become the parents, become the students, become the administrators, become the churches that we are, the ministries that we are supposed to be. For one reason and one reason only, we quit. Commitment is refusing to quit. You know, Joshua was the guy who God picked to succeed Moses. When God got ready to bring his people to the promised land, he told Moses, he said, you're not going to enter the promised land. I'm going to allow you to go to the promised land, but I will not allow you to go into the promised land. He said, Joshua was going to lead my people into the promised land. And so sure enough, God allowed Moses to lead them right up to it. And then he died. And Joshua, Moses' successor, actually led the children of Israel into the promised land. And they win Jericho. They they fight that battle. They win it. They go to another place uh, with the Amorites and they win that. They defeat Og and his army, and they're having victory after victory after victory after victory. And then all of a sudden, I think about chapter 6 or chapter 7 in Joshua, after all of these victories, they experience a defeat. It's at AI, and the way you spell AI is A-I, just in case you were wondering. So they get defeated at AI. And they discover that the reason why they got defeated is because they had sin in the camp. So what they do is they go in, they get rid of the sin, they deal with that, and then they go back, and now they defeat AI. Well, word starts spreading about Joshua and these children of Israel and God's chosen people and the God that they serve and how they're getting all of these victories and how they're just, you know, running over armies and things like that. Word starts spreading in the land. And, and, you know, the other kings who are in the immediate area say, we got to do something about this. So they decide to form what you would call a coalition. 
Well, all of them come together and it was sort of like the UN. They say together we're stronger and together we can defeat this one army. If it's more of us than it is of them, then we got to be able to defeat them. But the thing that they weren't counting on is it doesn't matter if it was three of them, if it was four of them, if it was five of them, if it was 10 or 20 of them. The thing that they didn't account for is the fact that Joshua and the children of Israel, the credit of their defeat didn't go to their prowess as an army, didn't go to their ability to uh, make military maneuvers. It didn't go to their strength, to their numbers, to any of that. It was strictly because of the God that that they served. They had favor with Jehovah Jireh. And that's the reason why they gained victory after victory after victory. And if I was trying to pe preach to you, I would pause right there and tell you that it don't matter how many enemies attack you. It don't matter how many schemes Satan put together if you've got God on your side. If, 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 if Jehovah Jireh is in your corner, if you got Jehovah Nisi fighting for you, all you got to do is stand still and see the salvation of your God. But I ain't come here to preach. I came to teach. So watch what happens. They're hearing about all these victories. They get together and say, we know what we're going to do. We're going to form a coalition. We're going to get together and we're going to defeat them. Joshua chapter 9 one group got smart. They said, we're not going to fight against them. We're going to figure out a way to get with them. So this is what they did. They walk up to Joshua. They meet Joshua. And they said to him, your servants have come from a very far country because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard the report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, the king of Heshbon, to Og, the king of Bashan, who was at Ashtaroth. It says, so our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spoke to us, saying, take provisions in your hand for the journey and go to meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Now then, make a covenant with who? Us. Go back to verse 9. I want you to see this. Okay? Watch this. They said to him, your servants have come from a far what? Country. Keep that in your mind. Give me the next verse. This is the other thing they told him. They said, we heard about everything your God did. He said, so our elders told us, take provisions in your hand for the journey and go and meet them and say to them, we are your servants. Make a covenant with us. Watch verse 12. This our bread was what? When we took it for our provisions out of our houses on the day that we had left to come to you. But now, behold, it has become dry and what? Crumbled. Crumbled. These wineskins which we feel were what? New. And behold, now they are what? They're torn up. And these, our clothes and our sandals are worn out because of the very long what? Yeah. What are they doing? They're telling them a story of pity. Watch this. Listen, listen, listen. This is what's going on. When you read the verses before this, you find out that, matter of fact, they hadn't come from a very far country. See, God had told his people not to be in covenant or relationship with the people immediately around them. And the Gibeonites were one of those sets of people who were immediately around them. They knew that God had commanded Israel to not be in relationship with them. So when they go to them, they say, we're going to trick them. We're going to tell them we came from a very far what? And what they did was they packed up old bread and they, put, and they brought it with them. So it looked like that they traveled from a very far what? And they took old wineskins with them. And they took old beat up sandals and wore out clothes. Boy, they put a story together. And then they came to Joshua and they said, man, we've been traveling from a very far what? And we came... To see, we heard about your God and the great things that he's doing and the awesome things he's doing for y'all. And so we want y'all to make a what? Covenant with us. We want y'all to be in with us. First of all, let me just drop this off to you. How many of you know that everybody who with you ain't with you for the right reasons? Woo! Everybody who say they're your friend? Come on, somebody. They are not your what? You better learn that. Amen. That's why you keep yeah. your business off of Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> K 
keep your business off of Instagram. <laughs> Twitter don't mean you no good. <laughs> All right, I'm true. <laughs> but I'm really not. Listen, listen, listen. Everybody who say they with you, they are not really what? They're not really with you. They tricked them. They, they, they made up this story. Why? In order to get in good with them. Why they wanted to get in good with them? For their own protection. Watch what happens. Verse 14. So the men of Israel took some of their provisions. They took some of the provisions of the Gibeonites. Here's the problem though. And did not ask for counsel of the Lord. Listen up. They did not ask for counsel of the Lord. You know how you get into commitments that you shouldn't be in? <laughs> you know how you end up in commitments and you end up going high in the world? Did I get here? It's when you don't ask for counsel of the Lord. Some of y'all married right now. And you didn't know he was crazy. Don't look at him. Stay up here. Stay up here. Stay up here. You didn't know she was crazy. But where you messed up at is you did not ask. Come on, somebody. She fine, pastor. He's so good looking. Mm -hmm. I almost fell into that trap myself. Serious. And Joyce know this. Like, people be like, you're going to get in trouble one day. Listen, I don't tell y'all nothing Joyce don't already know. Amen. Amen. There's a whole lot of stuff I tell Joyce I would never tell y'all. <laughs> Before me and Joyce got married, I was looking for a wife. I'm a young preacher, young pastor. I'm not married. I'm just waiting on the one that God sent me. So I started dating this one chick, uh, and she was fine. Uh, pretty lady. I can say that. Joyce, no. I ain't scared. She know. Uh, and she ain't worried about it. Joyce, no, I ain't going nowhere. Ain't she? she told me on the way over here, you ain't going nowhere. Only way you leave me is in the box. I said, wait, what? <laughs> that don't sound right. Don't say that, even if you mean it right. So I'm dating her, and, and she finds she pretty, everything. And, and what I really love, I'm a young preacher, you know, at the time. And what I really love is she a Christian. Not just a Christian, but like a super Christian. Like she, yeah, like one, yeah. She got a big Bible. Everywhere she go, she always in Bible study and always at church. The girl had me in church all night on New Year's Eve. That was the first time I ever spent, even as a young minister, all night in church on New Year's Eve. I'm... I liked it, so I put a ring on it. I asked her to marry me. She said yes. Then here's what happened. Lord said, you better... You, you might want to ask me first. But I said, Lord, like she got everything. She been a Christian. She know the word. She church goer. She the whole nine yards. Like she got everything. Lord said, you might want to ask me first. So then I started praying. She got the ring. I started praying. I'm like, Lord, you know, first of all, if this ain't the one, I done gave her my ring. But I still want you to show me if she is the one. And Lord, if she's not the one, I need you to make a billboard clear to me. And you know I'm a little slow. So you got to put it right here. I started praying that prayer, man, and where everything was smooth and peachy king, she started acting crazy. I mean crazy. Like all of a sudden, out of nowhere, disappearing for four and five days and telling me, somebody ever tell you something to make you look at the phone? Like, <laughs> I 
Anybody ever think? <laughs> Stuff like that. So now I got to figure out how to get my ring back. <laughs> so like I didn't tell her like I was breaking up with her. I was just like, hey, uh, let me see your ring. She gave it to me. Yeah, I don't think this working out. This <laughs> Listen, <sighs> but I was about to make a permanent commitment to somebody God didn't want for me. And then a little while later, I met Joyce. And as beautiful and as fine as she was, she didn't fit the mold. She, she was Catholic. She, she went to Catholic church and she wasn't uh, uh, Protestant, and she didn't know the Bible from cover to cover. I led her through assurance of her salvation and, and made sure she knew the Lord. And the whole time, God saying, that's her. And I'm fighting with God going, that can't be her. Because she don't have a big Bible. She don't go to church all the time. God saying, that's your wife, man. And even though I know that's my wife, I'm fighting that's my wife because it don't look like my picture. And I almost committed to something that wasn't for me because it looked like my picture. And, and yet God had something totally different. And when I inquired of him, he showed me something different. And now she's been married to my crazy behind for 15 years. And I'm loving her so good, she said, the only way you're leaving me is in a box, boy. Ow! I got game, baby. You can't fall for everything that look good. Some stuff look like it's perfect to you. You better inquire of the Lord. You better ask God what he wanted to do because his picture might be different from yours. We get ourselves into commitments we don't need to be in. When we don't seek counsel from the Lord. And then we get in and we're like, Lord, you really expect me to keep it? Yep. What's commitment, Pastor? It's refusing to quit. What did Joshua and the children of Israel do? I'll tell you what they did. Give me chapter 10. Watch what they did. Then the men of Gibeon, the same men, sent word to Joshua at the camp at Gilgal saying, do not abandon your servants. Now they're going to lay a guilt trip on them. Why are they saying that? Because the other kings, when they found out that the Gibeonites had committed to the children of Israel, they said, oh, well, we're going to get y'all too. So they started lining up to attack them. So the Gibeonites did what they were planning to do from the beginning. They reached out to the Israelites and said, don't leave us out here by ourselves. Y'all done made this commitment to us. Now tell the truth, you in church. Raise your hand if you would have kept your commitment to them. Come on. Well, y'all mean, but at least y'all honest. Amen. <laughs> but watch this. Save us and help us for all the kings of the Amorites that live in the hill country have assembled against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the valiant warriors. They kept their commitment. Even though it didn't look like what it looked like before they got in it. What, what is it about them, the difference between them and us? They understand what commitment is. Commitment is deciding that I'm not going to quit. It's deciding that I can't get out. It's deciding that I'm not looking for a way out. It's killing all other options and deciding I'm in this for good. Cortez, back in 1519, I think it was, rolled up onto the shores of Veracruz, Mexico, with about 600 men to fight the Aztecs. He rose up there, and this was actually his third trip. They had been defeated twice before. They rolled up on the shores of Veracruz, Mexico, 
And Cortez orders his men to offload everything from the ships, every supply, every need, everything, get everything off of the ships. And they did exactly that. He turns around and he orders some men. He says, now burn the ships. Burn the ships. Burn the ships. They burnt the ships. And you can imagine 600 and something men standing there watching as they ride home is burnt to ashes. You know what message he was sending? We got to win. Quitting ain't an option. Retreating is not an option. We got to get this done. And because quitting was not an option, because retreating was not an option, 600 men defeated an army that was multiple times their size. And as a result, Cortez became the conqueror of Mexico. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying I'm looking for, God's looking for at Faith Bible Church. We need some people who will burn the ships. Some people who make up in their minds, you know what? Lost souls are too important for me to ever give up on my commitment to the Lord. And I'm willing to work through frustration. I'm willing to work through people getting on my nerves. I'm not going to be distracted. I'm not going to be so aggravated. I'm not going to allow myself to be pulled away. Life is not going to take me out of it. I'm joining this mission and I'm in it until God calls me home because I understand what commitment is. Man, I tell you what, you give me 10 people like that. We'll win this community for Christ. This entire building won't be big enough. In your own personal life, you got some areas where you need to burn the ship. Me and Joyce agreed before we got married that we would never say the D word. Divorce. Fifteen years later, neither one of us have said the D word. Why? Because we understood that if divorce was an option, at some point we would take it. Why? Because at some point things get tough. Amen. And we've never said divorce, but she put me out one time. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> All my stuff on the porch. She ain't even put it in the plastic bins with the totes from Temple. She said she ain't wanted to, her Christmas decorations was in there. She put it in the trash bag. She told me again on our way here, divorce ain't an option, but I kill you. You know why we quit so many things? Because we allow quitting to be an option. You know why we don't succeed in a lot of cases? Because quitting is an option. I'm looking at some folks, you should have been finished with school. One reason why you ain't finished yet, because you allow quitting to be an option. I'm looking at some folks, you ought to be so much closer to retirement. One reason why you're not. Quitting was an option. I'm looking at some folks, you should have been out of debt. There's only one reason why you're not. Quitting was an option. Commitment says, I'm, I'm burning the ships. I'm getting rid of the option to get out. I'm solely dedicated, solely focused. I'm, I'm all in, no matter what happens. Hey, what area of your life do you need to burn the ships in? Do you need to just make up in your mind, I'm going to be committed? You know when Faith Bible will go to the next level? We got some people, in, when we have some people in Faith Bible who get totally committed, who make up in their minds, I'm not going to be pulled away, I'm not coming down off the wall no matter what happens. Y'all listen to me. When we get more, I wish I had about 50 Mike Celestines. I get, just, matter of fact, just give me 10, Michael and Monica Celestines. Why them, Pastor? Because we would have a crazy church. I'm serious. Y'all know he crazy. 
But I'm going to tell you all this too. We'll have a church that will win the world. Why? Mike's committed. Monica's committed. Monica just had surgery a couple weeks ago. Breast cancer. Mike, every year for I don't know how long, probably 15 years, has been taking kids up to kids across America, driving the bus. Every year. They call him Mr. KAA. <laughs> this year his wife had surgery two or three weeks ago. She came out fine. Everything's good. Cancer hadn't spread. Watch this. I said, well, Mike, who's taking your place on the KAA trip? He said, oh, no, Pastor, I'm going. And me, you know, I'm going to be the pastor. No, you're not. You're going to stay home and take care of your wife. He said, she told me I better not miss. She told me she fine. I better go take care of those kids and make sure they get connected to Jesus. commitment. That's burning the ship. Now watch this. No telling how many kids are going to know the Lord and their kids going to know the Lord and their kids kids going to know the Lord and their kids 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 going to know the Lord and their kids 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 going to know the Lord. Why? Because he was just committed to driving the bus. He found something that he felt God wanted him to do, and he burned the ship. Ain't no getting out of it. There's no laying it down. There's no quitting. What area in your life do you need to burn the ship in and get committed? For some of us, it's in the area of your own spiritual growth. You should be light years spiritually away from where you are. The simple fact is you, you, you won't burn the ship. You won't come to life group. You won't get in the discipleship class. And as a result, Satan has you right where he wants you. Spiritually stuck. Not knowing any more word than when you first got saved. You ought to burn the ship. You ought to make up in your mind, I'm not just signing up, I'm showing up. Why? So that I can grow. So I can be a stronger Christian. As a father, I want to be able to teach my kids what the Word of God says. As a mother, I want to be able to teach my kids what the Word of God says. I want to be able to tell them and pass to the next generation in my family what God says. You gotta burn the ship.